Greetings. Welcome to another message on behalf of Torchlight Interfaith Ministries. My name is Minister Michael Muhammad, and we will be uh, delivering the message today on behalf of Torchlight Interfaith Ministries. We thank you for tuning in and uh, giving us your attention, and we pray that the words we speak, the message we deliver, as it has been placed on our mind and heart by Almighty God, will in some way shed light, in some way bring healing, in some way bring inspiration, and in some way bring us all closer to Almighty God, which is coming closer to our true self. I would like to first begin in the name of the one God, the great grand architect of the universe, the designer, the engineer of both heaven and earth, the originator of all that was, all that is, all that will be, the father, the nurturer, the sustainer of all life, wherever it is, in whatever form it is, the controller of both life and death, the God who is called by so many names throughout the planet. We know that the ancient uh, Egyptians had 29 names that they identified or characteristics of the creator uh, that they identified for the one God. We know that the Buddhists have 38 names that they attribute to the characteristics, the nature the features of Almighty God, the Creator, the source of our existence. The uh, Jewish community, if you will, the Kabbalists, have identified 72 names for God. Names which, when looked at, bring light. When spoken, project light and power and connect us to the source of creation. We know that as Christians, we have been taught that there is one name above all other names. And as Muslims, we have been given uh, what the scholars call the 99 attributes of Almighty God, with the greatest name for God, the name that encompasses all other names, the proper name for God, if you will, Allah as that one God. Whatever name we have been taught, to call on God by whatever faith tradition we come from, whatever our understanding of Almighty God is, what is important is that we understand that God is one. And we should not be frustrated when someone uses a name that we weren't raised to know or understand. Just as there are many peoples on the planet, there are many, many, many languages on the planet, but all of the human family, both man and mankind, have a way of uh, calling on the supreme being, the creator, uh, and invoking his 
presence, his spirit, his mind, his power. And just as it is frustrating when we hear a person trying to communicate or communicating uh, in a language we don't understand, this is how we respond similarly to people who use a name for the creator that is not from our tradition. But we have to be mature enough to understand that as the scripture says, you must speak in a language that the people can understand. And so the creator has permitted these languages. He's permitted these faiths. And so he has endowed them with some truth and some knowledge that maybe over here in my corner of the world, I am unfamiliar with. So God is one. God is one. I greet you all with peace be unto you. Or in the language of the prophets, they would say, um, Shalom Aleikum or Asalam Aleikum, uh, whether they spoke Aramic or Aramaic, Hebrew, Arabic, or our common language here, English. I thank you again for giving me a few minutes of your time, and I promise we will not waste your time with trivial stuff and frivolous conversation. Our message today is the man of God, part two. We want to do, or we've been encouraged to do a part two, to speak a little deeper into the idea that man and God have a symbiotic relationship. This is important because we're living in a day and a time where people have really changed their understanding of God so much that our standards, our moral compass, our standards for our behavior and how we speak and how we treat one another is going much further down than many of us may have imagined it would ever go. Some of us have uh, mistakenly come to believe that we should not have a high expectation for man because man can never be God. Man can never be like God. Man is not of God. Man is uh, so far away from God that we lower our expectations on men and women so low we've separated ourselves so uh, far from the uh, reality of God that uh, we find ourselves in a world where many of us, so many of us are lost. So many of us are confused. So many of us, as I was in uh, a service yesterday and uh, I was listening to uh, a person giving remarks and the remarks were profanity laden. The marks were laced with language that maybe we use uh, in private, maybe we might use in public, uh, uh, maybe here and there we use some profanity even in our house and maybe even our daily doings. Uh, this is not unusual, but as a people, we used to have a boundary where when we stepped in a sanctuary committed 
to the worship and remembrance and devotion to the God of our uh, understanding, we, we would feel uncomfortable not uh, uh, or being unpresentable. We would feel uncomfortable uh, uh, speaking words that maybe we would speak when we take our choir robe off or our preacher's uh, robe off or uh, our, our, our usher or deacon uniform off or our Sunday dress or suit off. We would make sure we had those things tucked nicely away before, you know, we let our hair down and, and let a few uh, cuss words slip out. But now is <laughs> so many of us that don't understand the nature of God and our own nature in relationship to God. There's so many of us that are living according to the popular trends that are receiving direction from our own uninformed, uncultivated, errant thoughts. And so this subject, the man of God, is very important. Do you, as you're listening to me, have a man of God that gives you guidance in your life? When you look at your friends and your family, do they have a man or woman of God whose voice can call them to attention, whose voice they will go to seek understanding uh, about the word of God, the way of God, the expectations of God, the way we should make decisions about our life and our affairs, who is that man or woman of God that is there? So let's talk about it for a few minutes. Because many of us believe that I'm not going to listen to any preacher. I'm not going to listen to any preacher. I'm not going to listen to any teacher or minister or priest or rabbi or imam or guru. I, I will figure it out all on my own. And when I'm confused, I will just make a decision. And I'm going to live my life totally the way I want to live my life without any regard for morality, for any regard for what we might call do's and don'ts. I'm just going to do whatever feels good to me. Well, we have feelings and we should engage them, but we must understand uh, why we are endowed, why we are created with feelings and cravings and desires and longings and yearnings in the flesh. And what is the difference between those fleshly yearnings and the yearnings of the spirit? Do you uh, think that you know, preachers and spiritual teachers, pastors, ministers, imams, gurus, priests, uh, and all of the like really have no part in your business affairs. Do, do you believe that you should make money and however you make money, you should not feel guilty uh, even though you may uh, exploit people to earn a living. It, does that bother you or not? Have you any type of healthy moral compass in your affairs? And do you believe that you can get that from a so-called man of God? These are important questions because even though it is said that uh, I think about 80% of us claim, in the black community at least, <laughs> claim uh, to be involved with some type of religion, uh, the religious services, 
when you look at the way we are living, dear family, much of the way that we're living, much of the decisions we're making does not reflect people with a healthy moral compass. Maybe you feel that you should figure it out on your own because you're listening to somebody who is telling you that there is no value in the word of God, whether that's the uh, Pentateuch or the New Testament or the Quran or the uh, scriptures or writings of the Taoist and the, or the Taoist or the, 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 the uh, Vedas or some other uh, word that has guided people for many, many centuries you now believe that all of these things are so corrupt that they have no part or place in helping you find direction in life. Maybe that's what you believe. Maybe that's what you believe. But sometimes our belief is just a belief and not a fact. The man of God. Maybe you've been fooled by a man or woman of God. Maybe you've been conned or misled or hurt or abused by a so-called man of God. And that has made you throw the baby out with the bathwater. Maybe, maybe you are from the segment or generations of our community that find that celebrity is how you find direction by imitating and emulating some celebrity is the way you find guidance in life. Where are you on this spectrum in relationship to this concept, the man of God? Is Jay-Z, as I've asked before, is that where you find your guidance from? You, you sit around social media and the entertainment world listening for kernels to drop from Jay-Z's mouth on how to become wealthy and successful in life. Uh, maybe, maybe LeBron, you listen for kernels of wisdom and knowledge or secrets from LeBron James. Maybe Lil Dirk or Dirk is... Who your sons and daughters are getting their direction from. Maybe it's Nicki Minaj or Herbo or Beyonce or some other entertainer. Are they standing in the place, in the role of the man of God in your life? Well, if you're feeding exclusively on celebrity and entertainers who for the most part, are not feeding that heavily. Many of the most popular ones don't feed too well at the spiritual trough of the word of God. And many of them, their moral compass needs work, tremendous work. And if you're listening to our rapping uh, rappers, our, our, our drill rappers, our gangster rappers, then, then what are you feeding in your mind, your heart, and your spirit? And what kind of guidance can you get uh, uh, to, to lead your own life? Which direction is the music and the entertainment world pulling you in? And I know what you're saying. Are the preachers any better? Well, sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're not. So let's talk about it. Was Kanye West correct when he made the uh, song, There's No Church in the Wild? Was Kanye correct? Because it seems as though there is no church in the wild. It seems as though we are breeding generation after generation of people who don't care about murder, who don't care about death, who don't care about compassion, who have no concept of being accountable 
to a higher power. It seems as though uh, profanity, vulgarity, it seems as though uh, gross nudity and all manner of complete sexual depravity and perversion is, is, is the standard and order of the day and being driven by the words of a, a celebrity. So if you, you, you getting your meals, your spiritual meals from celebrity, your intellectual meals from celebrity, what kind of person will you become? Because a man is what he eats. If you are a man or woman of God, who is the man or woman of God that you're influenced by, that you study from, that you drink in words of wisdom and guidance and deeper insight into the spiritual realm that you might feed God's people? Or has your ego grown so big that you take a few words from your bishop or your uh, archbishop or your pastor who raised you as a pastor and, and, and you, you, you throw the rest away. Well, it's hard to walk with a man of God when you really find one. And sometimes we become so full of ourselves as students of the man of God that we become uh, we, we fall away from being uh, what we were taught to be. But we'll get into that a little bit more later, God willing. The man of God, have you taken your elected officials and your politicians for guidance in life? Do you hang on the word of the president? Do you hang on the word of the governor? Do you hang on the word of your local official? Are you scouring the news every day trying to find direction from public officials? And if you're doing that, what, what, what kind of person are you? have you become and will you become if you take all of your guidance and dictates from what public officials, elected officials will say or do or demand or the expectations, rules, regulations, and laws that they advance for the public. What kind of life will you have? Well, if you say we don't need the man of God, a man of God, a woman of God, then we've got to ask ourselves, does morality even matter anymore? Is there really, uh, uh, is, is, does anything qualify as being too much? Does anything qualify as being evil? Do, does anything qualify? Is there, some, is there nothing wrong with, with, with savagery? Is there nothing wrong with pathological immorality and how it is taking over popular culture and our children are being nurtured in an environment where, they, where, where parents will play, you play to your children, profanity lace, sexual tirade lace lyrics, and you don't see that, you don't believe this is something that is harmful to the development of your children, the spiritual and intellectual development of your children. We, we, we don't see that there are no healthy spiritual moral boundaries that exist in our society for too many of us. Are there any true men of God? present in the world today. Who are they? What do they look like? What do they sound like? What kind of preaching and teaching are they giving? Because there's a lot of preachers and teachers out here. There's a lot of preachers and teachers out here. Uh, as I talked about in part one of this message, there are over 400,000 uh, churches 
or places of worship in the United States of America alone. So this would probably make it somewhere around at least one million so-called clergy or men and women of God uh, moving about uh, our society, but yet our society has no moral compass, yet our government has no moral compass, yet our families, most of us as adults, we've lost our moral compass. Our children have certainly have a very weak moral compass, but there's so many so-called men and women of God who have been uh, standing in the highways and byways, in the pulpits and the rostrums, preaching the so-called word of God. But are there any true men and women of God who are giving us what we're supposed to have as the people of God that we might resist the world and reflect what God brought us here to do. The man of God. What, what, what is man? What is God? And do they have any direct connection to one another? What kind of a man is ruling the United States of America? What kind of men are ruling the Western world and much of Africa and Asia? What kind of men are these? Are they men? Are they gods? What are they? We know black people in America are from God, but are we of God. Ha! What do you mean, brother? I'm asking. There's a difference from being from God but and being of God. You could be from your mother, from your father, but when we look at you and your lifestyle, are you of your mother and your father? Sometimes you need to look and see that the apple has fallen so far from the tree. Or sometimes the apple is close to the tree so it can feed off of the benefits of the tree, but the apple is not trying to be like the tree. Yeah, you may not understand that one, but I'll keep it moving. How do we identify a man of God. What does it look like? What does he look like? What does he sound like? What should he be preaching today for us to know that he is a man of God on time with God in today's world? Should he be preaching the same gospel message that was preached in slavery? Should he be preaching the same way, the same word, with the same spirit? That justified the mistreatment of an entire people? What kind of gospel should he be preaching? When we look to see, are there any real men and women of God? What are we looking for? Is it they have a mega church? Uh, is it they have a, 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 a expensive place of worship? Is it because they have tailor uh, cut suits and fine cars and and jewelry and trinkets and 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 they look like our our celebrities, they're just standing in the pulpit. How do we know when we see a man of God? How, what should we look for? Does a man of God need to be perfect to be considered a man of God? And does man, do we as men and women, is it possible for us? to be of God without being what we might call perfect or sinless. You know, 
I was reading about David, the king, the prophet. And at a certain point, the children of Israel, according to the narrative, became frustrated that they didn't have a king. And they put pressure on Samuel the prophet to, to anoint a king over them that they might be like everybody else. This need to be like everybody else. You know you're lost when you want to be like everybody else. It's so sickening to hear a new artist, to listen to your songs or your lyrics or your raps and notice that there's no originality there. You're trying to be somebody else. You're not trying to be like somebody else. You're trying to be somebody else. And so if you know the culture, it, we have had so many young people who went into music by trying to be exactly like somebody else. And, and some of them have been successful at it. So you can listen to 20 or 30 who may be at the top of the field of rap and they all almost sound exactly the same. They're talking about exactly the same thing. Over, oh, you can listen to f five or ten albums they put out, and 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 it, it's all talking about exactly the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over again. It doesn't show any growth. It doesn't show any development. It doesn't show any uh, really ingenuity, or it doesn't it doesn't really even show a lot of creativity. It's just a, it's just a, a imitation of somebody uh, who they decided to imitate. And so the children of Israel uh, grew to a point in their story, uh, biblically anyway, where they, they, they wanted to be like everybody else. What about you? Do you want to be like everybody else? Are you trying to be like the right person or the wrong person? Has trying to be like somebody led you down the dark path? Trying to be like somebody, has it led you to be lost in the wilderness needing to be found? So when the children of Israel put pressure on Samuel and Samuel went to God, God was angry that they wanted to be like everybody else because he had carved them out to be a special people. And when you look at black people in America, God has carved us out to be a special people, but we're trying to be like our former slave masters. We're trying to be like the plantation owners that stripped us of our true culture and our true identity and made a whole new people by the permission of God. We now are trying to be like them. Our expectations are the expectations that whatever they say, we can trust in. Whatever standards they set for how to live, we aspire to those standards, whatever rules they put in place, we aspire to those rules, no matter what level we're on. If, if you are in the streets, you, you want to be like Al Capone. If you're in the boardroom, you want to be like Bill Gates. If you're in the pulpit, you want to be like Billy Graham or some such preacher. You, you, you want to preach like white folks preach. So we are like Israel. We we, we always, we, we ask, we, we want to be like everybody else. And we're asking God to make us like everybody else. We, we don't really ask God to help us be found, find ourselves, find who we are, find why he made us to suffer so, why he treated our, allowed our ancestors to be treated so miserably and brutally and why we're still being shot down and murdered today almost 470 years after we were brought here in chains to be chattel property. We, we want to be like, we want to be like our captors. And so God said to Samuel, yeah, I'm going to appoint them a king. 
but there are going to be some consequences for them wanting to be like everybody else. And so Samuel went down at the direction of God to the house of Jesse, a man named Jesse. And he had this man bring out all his sons. And uh, Samuel brought out his son, one of his sons, and they say the man was tall. He had a height, he had stature. And Samuel thought he was the one. And every son that Jesse brought out, Samuel thought he was the one. Until he said to himself, after but really about the, about the first or second one, he said to himself, I'm going to wait for God to put his hand on me and let me know this next one is the one. And so in the midst of that, God, according to the book, told Samuel the prophet, look not on his countenance. Don't worry about how his face looked. He might be handsome. He might be, you know, pretty or whatever you want to call it. But don't look on that. Don't look at his stature, whether he's tall or short, uh, uh, because I have refused the ones that you thought was the one. And the book says that God said to Samuel that, you know, I, I see it not as man sees. For man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. And so Samuel, after he got through all of Jesse's sons, he says there's got to be another one because God hadn't, hadn't let him know that uh, any of those sons was, was the anointed one, was the chosen one. And so he had one son left way out in the field, tending to the sheep. And so Jesse said, yeah, I got one more son. Let me call him. He's out there with the sheep. We, we haven't seen him around the house too, too, too often because he's always out there you know, trying to you know, deal with the sheep. And so when David came, oh, the Lord spoke to Samuel and let Samuel know, this boy, this young man is a man after my own heart. He is going to be the new king. So how do we know when we're dealing with a real man or woman of God? If we look at external things, we will be fooled. If we look at the beauty or handsomeness or attractiveness alone of an individual, we can be fooled by that. Because what's on the outside, as we say, you cannot really judge a book by its cover. you got to put in the effort to read the book before you know what the cover really is all about. So it is with determining whether or not you're dealing with a man or woman of God. Because the mistake so many of us make is that we look at people and assume that they are like us. But on the inside, what God has put on the inside of them, we will misjudge and mishandle that person because we think they are like us because they dress like us or they look like us or they come from where we come from, but everybody ain't the same. And so later on in scripture is a verse, as we, some of us know, be careful how you entertain strangers because you could be entertaining angels unaware, meaning you can't look on the countenance of a person at all. All the time, you've got, to, you've got to be able to read a person. You've got to have the spiritual ability to discern the, the, the eyes, the face, the mouth, the sound, the movements, the energy of a person to know whether or not you're dealing with a true man or woman of God. So many of us go to the church because the preacher was dressed nice. 
because he laid out the sanctuary with state-of-the-art stuff and, and oh my God, it's popping at this church and they got the great meals after the service and we got this, that, or the other, but, but you may or may not be dealing with a real man or woman of God. Some people are in the business of preaching and that's when you're going to run into trouble. So, what does it mean to be a man of God? Do you have to be perfect to be of God? You know, I was listening to uh, some weeks ago the last services for our brother, the rapper DMX, and I was listening to my mentor uh, help to eulogize him with remarks and he commented on the fact that many people see or saw DMX as a prophet-like figure in the world of rap because even though DMX was rapping about what he was rapping about, he would always top it off with these uh, deep uh, these uh, very inspirational, these, these very uh, uh, intense prayers at the end of his albums, at the end of his shows, he would always bring people to God. And so some people in the world of rap began to call him a prophet. And so my mentor in his remarks validated DMX was a prophet. And so many so-called scholars and people of religion took offense to that. <laughs> Imagine that. The same way they took offense to Nat Turner being a Christian preacher. The same way they took offense to Denmark Vesey. The same way they took offense to that great Christian soldier, Sojourner Truth, and Harriet Tubman. The same way they took offense to the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King using his pulpit to fight for poor people. Sometimes the people who have set themselves up as the authority, as God's beside God, when a real man of God, when the real man of God speaks, it can be offensive. But how could he validate DMX as a prophet? What is a prophet? Well, a prophet does two things. Some prophets make predictions, but for the most part, that's not what all most of the prophets in the scripture did. Most of them gave a warning. Most of them gave an invitation to come back to God or to come to God. Most of them did were not Nostradamus-like figures. Most of the prophets... They lived their lives, and when God put his hand on them, they had to go and deliver the warning or the message. They had to go stand in the gap and challenge the forces of the world. That's primarily what a prophet does. So in the sense that prophets are messengers, DMX was in fact a messenger. Because sometimes to bring people to God, You've got to leave breadcrumbs. You've got to leave a trail of candy. You've got to leave a trail of cookies. You've got to leave a, a, a you know, you've got to create a, a thematic scheme that, that invokes a lot of drama and theater so that when you get them the way you really want them to be, they're closer into the bosom of Almighty God. And in his own way, that's what that brother DMX did. Raised by an abusive mother who abandoned him. She didn't know how to take him. Abandoned him in a foster home. Where he developed intense anger problems. And began uh, uh, in his teenage years. To be engaged in street life. In a life of crime. Petty crime. Then he found himself, himself addicted. To cocaine and other drugs. Yes, he was a prophet. He was a messenger. 
in the midst of our debauchery and our glamorizing murder and killing and all of the debauchery that we have sometimes been forced into and in most times decided to ge ge become engaged in, in the midst of all of that, he was a man who was a king of his world where at the end of everything he did, he was beckoning us to ask for forgiveness, to atone to God and come back to God and ask for the mercy and the protection of God Almighty in spite of how low we have fallen, you must understand that the nature of what he did is the nature of what a real man or woman must do. So DMX has said, you know, because of his experiences, he didn't know how to take love. He said that no, no matter how hard we are, we always need to be somebody's baby. Underneath DMX's rough message was a man who was in pain, a man who suffered at the hands of people who he should have been able to be protected by, the man of God. If DMX is a prophet, or could be called a prophet. Do we really have to be perfect to be of God? Do we really have to be perfect to be divine? Would the scriptures and the prophets of the scriptures validate DMX as a prophet? I don't know. But I know when I look in the scriptures, I see a prophet who got drunk and naked and they found him drunk and naked and had to cover his nakedness. I know when I read the scriptures, I see a man who they say uh, got drunk and slept with his daughters in his drunken stupor. I know when I look at the scriptures, I see a man who in a time of need and hunger, he went in and robbed the house of God of food. I, I know that that same man uh, uh, coveted his his uh, servant, or if you will, his his brother's wife, another man's wife, and sent that man to be killed after he impregnated that man's wife in secret, and and yet. God said that man was after his own heart. What does all of that mean? I know another man, the son of that man, who fell in love with strange women and started to uh, engage in all manner of sexual escapade and perversity. I know another man who God ordained or ordered, if you will, <laughs> to marry a prostitute. When you look at the prophets of God, none of them were perfect, but they were yet men of God. Oh, and we're getting into trouble now. I know some of us don't like to talk about this like this. What separates man from God? Most ancient people acknowledge in some form that humans could become divine. God is or could become human. And humans could give birth to gods. <laughs> what separates man from God? It reminds me of uh, uh, <laughs> the one they say is the greatest basketball player that ever lived, Michael Jordan. Larry Bird is quoted as saying, you know, he's, that uh, Michael Jordan is just God disguised as Michael Jordan. He's God in gym shoes. <laughs> and so Larry held his ground. They kept asking Larry, well, you, what, do you, what did you really mean what you said? He said, yeah, I never would have said it if I didn't mean it, that, that Michael Jordan, God is just disguised as Michael Jordan when it came to basketball, something as trivial as basketball. Here's 
is a is a man saying that he sees God on the court. If God was going to manifest himself in our world of basketball, I'm looking at God. What is God and what is man? We know that man, in order to be a man, you got to start off with male, right? The person having the X and Y chromosome. A person having male parts, right? Man is an adult male. So we go from child to boy, right? To man. In the ancient Sanskrit language, this word man means the progenitor of all human beings. Huh, think over that. How can man be the progenitor of all human beings if man is created by something other or some uh, creator who has no image? The book of Genesis says, so God created man in his own image and the image of God created he him, male and female created he them image, the representation of an external form, a shadow of a form, an outline of a form, a representation of the original. Who is the original man? If man is the progenitor of all humans, who is the original man? And if God, according to the biblical narrative, created man in his image, it would stand by simple mathematics that if man is the progenitor of all human beings, then the original man who is in the image and likeness of the creator are one and the same. Uh, that's tough to swallow based upon your theological training, your theological understanding, your theological interpretation, most of which stands at odds with the very scriptures that you use to base your theology in, the man of God. What does it mean to be a man? What reason does man exist? Man, man, if you're listening to this and you're a man, if you're listening to this and you're a woman, what reason does man exist? Because when you say woman, you're saying man, woman, man. When you say female, you're saying female. You are from the essence of man. You, you, you are in the creation of man if you're a woman or a female. So why does man exist? Is the creation homo? Is it hetero? Is it binary? What's the nature of the creation? Homo, hetero, or binary? What is it? Why do all creation stories from around the world, which context do they speak in? Homo, hetero, or binary. The Bible says the Lord formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. God formed man from the dust of the ground. This is talking about the body, right? The flesh, the bone. The Quran, the Holy Quran, the book of the Muslim world has a verse that says, and surely we created man of sounding clay, of black mud, aswan, black mud fashioned into shape. So, is telling us in the world of Islam that the original man is a black man. Hmm, that's tough for a lot 
of people in the world of Islam to talk about or accept. But this corresponds with the Bible, the dust of the ground. He formed man from the ground, the earth. The earth, if you know anything about the earth, the soil of the earth, that soil, that clay is rich. And if you put a seed in it, it's going to produce something. In fact, you don't even have to put a seed in it. It's already a seed in it by nature. And so when you leave a, a, a plot of land, a piece of land to its own uh, devices, it's going to start growing stuff. Stuff's going to start popping up out of the, 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 the soil, the earth that, that you didn't even know was there. And God, after he formed man, he breathed the breath of life into him. He gave man respiration. And respiration is necessary for life. But breath is a kind of a mysterious thing as we talked about before. Breath is something you can't grab, but it can grab you. It's something you can control to an extent, but it has total control over you. This thing, breath, is very mysterious. But what is a man? Pardon me. Man, created in the image and likeness of the creator. The external form, an image is an external form of something. So we cannot continue to tell the people that when the book says this, it's not talking about the physical image of the creator. That don't make no sense. It's not sound doctrine because we are afraid or we want to keep a secret from the people to let them know that when you talk about God, you're talking about man. And when you're talking about man, you're talking about God, but not man in today's form, not the kind of life we're living, not the kind of way we think, not the kind of theological, spiritual understanding that we have. We are a fallen man. We are a man who has fallen so far from the time of our creation that we really don't know our true selves. And we're so low that we've allowed the messengers of Satan himself to teach us about the God of creation. No wonder we're confused. The Old Testament speaks of the existence of a supreme being, the creator of the universe. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The name of the creator in, in, in that verse is a Hebrew name, Elohim. But he has other names, El Shaddai, the mighty God, El Elyon, the most high, El Olam, the everlasting, Elohim. It's a plural noun in form, but singular in meaning when it refers to the creator. How could God be singular and plural at the same time? Well, this is the argument of Christian theologians. When we talk about the uh, doctrine of the Trinity, but is that what it's talking about? Huh. The first use of the name Jehovah follows the creation of man. That name Jehovah is the self-existent one. How can he be the self-existent one? Well, to have a self and to exist, he brought himself from nothing into something, and he brought himself by a way that he he has the power to, to, to be a, in need of nothing because in his creation was produced everything that he needed for his creation. It came out of his creation and the source of himself, which gave him the power to produce creation. Hmm. So 
God created man in his own image. The image of God created he, him, male and female, created he them. When man, according to the biblical narrative, when man is to be dominant over creation, the word for God, Lord God, is used. Jehovah Elohim, the self-existent one, the self-existent one, God. The self-existent one, God. Lord God, the Hebrew name Lord in Hebrew is Yahweh. In English, it's Jehovah, meaning he is singular alone. So Jehovah Elohim means he starts out as a singularity, as one. He's alone. Hmm. Think over that. But by the time he gives man dominion over the planet, over the creation, Jehovah Elohim is used. So, what are we looking at here? We're looking in the names. When we're reading the names, if we understand the names, the names are giving us a narrative on how God is singular and plural and how when you look at man, you're looking at the image of the creator that he says in the narrative he created man in his own image. Well, if, if he is not a, a, a physical image, then we've got a problem. But we don't have a problem. We just have a problem of interpretation. And the wicked theologians who sometimes don't know and don't want to say they don't know and sometimes know but don't want to say what they know because theology has controlled humanity for thousands and thousands of years. And they know that only a few of us are that deep into the word to do more than pronounce the word, shout the word, shout the name, say the name. We don't understand that here in the word is the narrative of how God made man in his image. Elohim, Jehovah Elohim, he's singular, the self-existent one, but when he begins to be fruitful and multiply, when he vests man with power and dominion over creation, he's not just Jehovah, he becomes Jehovah Elohim, meaning he's multiplied himself. He's becoming plural. He's no longer just alone. He will always be singular and alone because he is the progenitor of all mankind. He is the self. He is that one, that first one that formed in creation. But when he vests Adam and Eve and Adam in particular with dominion, he gives him power to be his vice gerent. Now he's not only Jehovah, he's Jehovah Elohim. Because once Eve and Adam get together, there's no more singularity. <laughs> there's infin infinite plurality. Man, Adam, is the first biblical and Quranic name of the incarnate God. What does that mean, carnate? Meaning having a human body incarnate, the indwelling spirit in a body, the spirit of God in a body, the mind of God in the body, the power of God in a body, incarnate God. Hmm. Think over this thing. Man of God, of God indicates that I'm of it. I'm a part of it. I possess its qualities. Whatever it has, I have. I'm a part of, I have a quantity of whatever the self-existent one had. I have a quantity of that. So to be a man of God, hmm, 
It should be identity. It should be easy to identify a man of God if we know how to look. So later on in Scripture, we'll be concluding this very shortly, dear family. Bear with me, just a little bit longer. The man of God. Later on, over in the New Testament, in the book of Timothy. It's written that a man of God must be blameless. The husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, not greedy, filthy, not a striker, not in love with filthy lucre. Watch out now if you're a capitalist. He must be patient, not a brawler, not covetous. One that ruleth his own house well, having his children in subjugation with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall in the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. This was the standard. Now, in early Christianity, that the disciples of Paul articulated in the book of Timothy, what man do you know that's blameless? The meaning don't mean that he don't have some blame that could be attributed to him, but it means that he lives in such a way that the righteous really have nothing bad to say about him. The husband of one wife, meaning he, he knows how to be loyal and make a commitment and dedicate it to one woman and building a family around the woman of God. He's sober. He ain't turning a bottle up after preaching. He ain't going to the club getting drunk. He don't have a wet bar at home in his study. He's sober. He's vigilant. He's always watching the people of God, just like David the prophet. He was out in the field. He had to keep watching the sheep. He was studying the sheep. He was trying to figure out what was going on with the sheep. The man of God must be vigilant. He must be of good behavior. Good behavior. Meaning he got morality. He got moral based behavior. He has manners. He has etiquette. He's not loud for the sake of being loud. He's not offensive. He, he's not abrasive with people because he has no patience. He, he has to be of good behavior. Meaning you can drop your wallet and he'll give it back to you. Meaning if you're hungry, he may find a way to help share his bowl of, 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 of soup with you or, or his meal with you. He's always on good behavior, as we used to say. He's given to hospitality. He's hospita hospitable. He knows how to treat strangers. And he's apt to teach. Well, in order to teach, you've got to learn. And so a man of God can be found in the word of God. Because a man of God is going to teach you God's way. He's going to try to teach you about God. And he's going to try to teach you about God so that you can learn about yourself. He's not given to wine. He's not greedy. He's not in love with God with material stuff, filthy lucre. He ain't, he ain't in on the lick. He ain't in on the, you know, uh, the scams. He ain't card cracking. He's patient. He not a brawler. Don't mean he can't brawl, just mean he's not a brawler. Meaning, you know, he, 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 he know how to tolerate a lot of foolishness. 
even when you should be hit in your mouth, as many of the old prophets, uh, uh, in ancient prophets, God made them take out a sword and kill people. God made them take a staff and pop people in the head. God had made the prophets of old huh, check us physically. Hmm, think over that. He's not covetous. He rules his own house well, having his children in subjugation with all gravity. That part is hard, 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 because you know we got PKs, and the PKs, they resent their father or their mother for being a man or woman of God, and so in their rebellion and resentment, they don't look well ruled or in subjugation to the man or woman of God. But some of the men of God are better at that than others. Hmm. He's not a novice. Meaning, you know, he's not naive to the ways of God or the ways of the world. He's not a novice and he knows how to negotiate and help us negotiate our, the affairs of life in a way that we're in the world but not of the world. He, he doesn't become a puffed up with pride where he's, he's in love with his own image. He wants to hear his name all the time. He's happy if a million people are saying his name and not the name of the creator. He, he gets puffed up with pride. And sometimes you could be so effective, so successful as the man or a man of God that you uh, find thousands of people listening to you in your church. You got a mega church and whatnot. You got a, thousands of people coming to hear you as an evangelizer or whatever you do, and it goes to your head. And so you become vain. You, you become obsessed with stuff and not delivering the people to God. Moreover, he must have a good report. He must have a good report, meaning if you go out in the community and you ask about him, you'll get a good report. He's not out there running scams. He's not out there ab abusing the people in any kind of way. He has a clean hand when it comes to the report you receive from the people from without, the scripture says. So it's given us a standard in the New Testament for how to spot a man of God. It goes on to say that uh, the man of God mu uh, must be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in pure conscience. And let these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a preacher, of a minister, of a pastor, of a deacon, of a bishop, being found blameless, meaning he, that person is engaged in the struggle the jihad, if you will, in Islamic terms, against the lower self, meaning they are disciplining themselves according to a moral expectation that many times is, is, is hard, is painful, is difficult because you, you got so uh, 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 much uh, uh, weight on you to try to be and do and speak the word that God has put in you and be an example of that word that's sometimes just hard for you to find space to relax. Because people always want something from you. They never want to know what they can do for you. They always want to know what you can do for them. They will call you when they have a problem and they will talk you from sun up to sundown, but they never have an interest in 
in a, any problem or difficulty that you may be having. They will always tell you their problems and assume you don't have any. They will always believe that you don't have a need even though you're making a sacrifice for the word and the way of God. They will, oh my God, they, they will hit the jackpot in Vegas and, and, and walk on by the man of God even though the man of God might have holes in his shoes because he's trying to live up to the standard of God. And sometimes we take very, very poor care of a true man or woman of God. We, we, the, the, those who are pimping and hustling in the business of preaching, they give preaching and teaching a bad name. So the ones who are true men and women of God, people will sometimes look at them like they look at those other ones and do not support them like they deserve to be supported. Hmm. And the book says that even, even the man of God, God's wife must be grave, not slanderous. She must be sober. She must be faithful in all things. This is a heck of a way to ask a man or woman to be in a world like this. When there's so much provocation everywhere. Everybody wants to be provocative. Everybody wants to be seen. You can't turn the radio on without talk of sex and sexuality and sexual perversity. You can't hear the news without them talking about somebody's sexuality. You, you can't watch a, 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 a baseball game without sex being so sex, sex, sex is everywhere. And, and, and lying and cheating and conning and flim flamming and gaming people is everywhere. The lust to have bigger, better, more expensive stuff and not to be in the regular seats, to be in the skybox, in the VIP section. I don't want to fly coach. I got to fly first class or business class. All of this drive in society is, is so dominant and pervasive. If you, if you, if you look at at what is expected of a true man of God, that person is under tremendous pressure in a world like this to keep spots off of their garment. And so when you meet a man or woman of God, you usually look at them as weird or strange, that they don't play the lottery, that they don't sip wine, that they don't want to come to the club and party all the time. That they don't want to uh, kiss and tell and have sexual conversations about what you do with a woman and what you did to a woman and what she did to you. And, and, and they don't have them kind of conversations. They don't want to engage in those kind. As a matter of fact, they'll shut you down when you get around a real man or woman of God. A real man or woman of God is not going to put a, a, a sugar on my manure and they're going to call out the rappers. They're going to call out the entertainers. They're going to call out the politicians. They're going to call out the forces in this world that are causing God's people to be oppressed, to cause that are causing the truth of God to be suppressed. You, when you find a man or woman of God, they are both patient and gentle and kind and giving. But on the other side of that coin, when you step over the line with them, they will bring the sword of the word of God down to bear on the neck of your evil and your deviation in a way that you cannot escape no matter how much you try to run. And so you will learn not to play with a man of God if there's any God in you. Now, I have to say, I have seen people play with the man of God. I have seen people who dismiss the word and the way of the man of God. And so it's hard to follow and be near the man of God. Because the man of God, he handles God's people in a way that, you know, sometimes it's a little hard to understand. 
And so it takes spiritual cultivation to follow along with the man of God and not allow yourself to come out of character from the way of God, even when you're dealing with wicked people who are coming in the name of God, but they really are not of the God. They really have their own personal agenda. They want to use the word of God for their gain, their benefit, and not the gain and benefit of the people of God. See, when you find a real man of God, that man is of the people. He ain't of himself. He's for the people. He ain't just for himself. See, this is, this is one of the great distinctions you can find in a man of God and somebody that just perpetrating a fraud. The man of God must confront the forces of the world. The man of God must tell you, don't tattoo your body because God said so. Don't pierce your body because God said so. Don't put that on because God said so. Don't do that because God said so. Don't speak like that because God said so. You can't treat the people like that because God said so. You should not govern. The, you should shouldn't pass that law because it goes against the word, the will, and the way of God. The man of God has no fear in the face of evil and the enemy. The man of God can be heard crying out in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord because we're going to reap what we sow one day and no man knows the hour or the day. And so as I move to conclude this, are you trying to be a man or woman of God? Or are you trying to be something you saw on TV? Something you saw on social media? Why are we all walking around looking like entertainers with red and purple and green hair and all kind of lavish costume type outfits as though we're going to shoot a, 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 a music video or we're going to perform on the stage, but we walking down 47th Street. We walking down 39th Street. We, 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 we walking down Pulaski. We on, we on Chicago Road dressed like Nicki Minaj or Cardi B. You know, you understand what I'm saying? We, we, we walking down State Street, South State Street. We, we dress like Lil Dirk. We dress like Future. We at the party styling and profiling. We trying to look like Jeezy. What is wrong with us? Why don't we see that we are under the hand of the enemy and not under the hand of a man or woman of God. But there is a man in America whose voice we must consider, and that is my mentor. You must consider his voice because he stood in the gap and there is no evil report of him. Even though the enemy has tried to give an evil report of him, as the truth begins to come out, even the evil report is put to death and identified as a trick of the enemy. There is a man of God who has called all the so-called men of God to the carpet. There is a man of God present who has called the people of God to the carpet. There is a man of God who have challenged the forces of the world, the forces of Satan, the forces of evil, and given them their last warning. There is a man of God present that if you listen to him, he, you will find guidance in his words. You will find guidance in the students of his word. There is a man of God present who we can look at as a perfect example of how to identify a man of God in your midst. He is the man of God, but he's not the only man of God because we're living in the time of the Messiah where men of God are going to be unfolding with every space of time. That messianic figure is going to give birth to us the messianic type men of God who will be scattered out among the people of God and so that God can try to reach his people and bring us into our true kingdom. Uh, think over this. 
So as I conclude, find you a man or woman of God to give you a moral compass who will challenge your evil to yourself, who will correct your evil to others, who will teach you the way, the wisdom of Almighty God, who will find a way to reach you wherever you are with a message that you can understand, the man of God. I thank you for being patient as we deliver part two of this message, the man of God. May God bless you with the light of understanding, with the light of understanding and a heart to love God and love yourself for you are the image and the likeness of God himself. I leave you as I came before you with the greeting words of peace. Peace be unto you. Shalom Aleichem. Assalam Aleichem. Until our next message. If you'd like to support Torchlight Interfaith Ministries, please follow the links provided and attached to this video. Peace and blessings.